1940. The shadow of tragedy and defeat hung over our country. France had collapsed, and the BEF, fighting the greatest rearguard action ever known, reached the fire-swept beaches of Dunkirk. Only the fighting spirit of the troops themselves and the achievements of our seamen and the Royal Air Force saved them. Their equipment was lost, but the men brought back were all ready to repel the invader. Britain was indeed on the defensive. It was then that Mr. Eden announced the formation of the Home Guard, or the Local Defence Force, as it was first called. The response was immediate and overwhelming. From all over the country, volunteers rolled in, and soon they were in training. At first, they were short of equipment, uniforms and weapons. Short of everything, in fact, except that indomitable spirit which carried us through. Inspired by the leadership of Mr. Churchill, our war factories worked day and night in a desperate effort to re-equip our forces before the impending invasion was launched. As a prelude to a full-scale attack, the Luftwaffe was sent in terrific strength to blast our aerodromes and defence works and so ensure a successful channel crossing. We all know the story of those days, how those few men in those few aeroplanes flung themselves against the mass of attackers matching German numbers with unbelievable courage and beating them from the sky. Never was the spirit of Britain better displayed to the world, but it was a defensive courage courage in the very face of disaster. In those days, it was always the same story, defense. When the Germans began their wholesale attacks on our cities and towns, British civilians were in the front line for the first time. Powerless to hit back, their bravery in the face of danger, their we can take it attitude was another serious blow to Nazi plans. As our factories turned out more aeroplanes, tanks and munitions of all kinds, we can take it, change to we can give it back. To our increasing output were added the vast industrial resources of the United States. Everybody was looking forward to the day when our aircraft would smash deep into Germany's war industries, when our tanks would crash through the Nazi panzer divisions, when Britain would turn from defense to attack. The implements of war were piling up. New factories were getting into full production, many of them underground, safe from German bombs. More and more girls took their place in industry, releasing men for sterner jobs. Surely we should soon be on the offensive again. Home Guard was now more fully equipped and trained so that greater numbers of our regular troops could be sent abroad to other theatres of war. Russia, at first sorely pressed and fighting for her life, had changed to the offensive. British built tanks promised by the government on behalf of British workers were helping to repel the Germans before Moscow before Leningrad and in the Ukraine. Russia's fight against tremendous odds thrilled the world. In the tank factories, superhuman efforts were being made to fulfill our obligations. Russia must go short of nothing she needed, and at the same time our own growing mechanized strength had to be not only maintained, but increased. By night, our bombers were striking hard, deep into the heart of Axis war industries. To the Wellingtons, the Whitleys and the Hamptons had been added bigger, faster types. Manchester, Stirling, Halifax and Lancaster. 
names which strike a chill of fear into the German heart. Our fighters, instead of facing overwhelming odds over Britain, were carrying the war to the enemy. Every day, hundreds of them were swarming over the channel on offensive sweeps or escorting bombers on raids over occupied territory. In doing so, they kept a large part of the fighter strength of the German Luftwaffe on the Western Front and helped the Red Air Force in the struggle to gain command of the air in the east. For the first time since the war started, the enemy were being harassed and kept guessing, and what was far more important, they were being forced on the defensive. Commandos were raiding the occupied coastline from Norway to France. The Nazis never knew where the next blow would fall, and large numbers of their first-line troops had to be held in readiness for coastal defence. Our paratroops, trained for attack, were soon in action. At last, the initiative was passing to Britain. American troops arrived from across the Atlantic. Their purpose, not so much to strengthen our defense, but rather to be on hand, ready to play their part in the last great offensive, the Allied offensive. It was a new spirit. Army training now was primarily in methods of attack. secret of this great change. Simply the unconquerable spirit, the will to win of the people as well as of their leader. Everybody played a part in the defense period. It is even more important that everybody should play a part now. We have shown our ability to take it. Now let's show that Britain can give it back, not tenfold, not a hundredfold, but a thousand times. Lend to defend was the slogan two years ago. Now it is back the attack. Already the tremendous on.